Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> it is with enormous uh, pleasure and uh, really distinct honor that I, I speak on behalf of Harvard Law School in welcoming Governor Romney back to campus, where he has not been in a while. And I will ask some questions. And yes, photographs can be taken. <laughs> um, there are seats in the front for people who are coming in. Uh, and I will make sure to have some time for you to ask questions. But I want to say, Governor, I crowdsource my questions. Ah, good. And the very first one, I confess, is not mine. But it's a good one. So here it goes. Your NCAA bracket. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't want to have any partisanship here at the beginning, anyway, but how did you make your picks? Uh, let's see. Well, there were the teams I wanted to win, and uh, I decided to put that aside as I put my bracket together. I, I knew something about which teams had the talent, but in my own calculation, talent was part, maybe a third. A third was also what I thought the energy and passion would be of the team. Would they be overconfident? Would they be energetic and, and feeling like they had an uphill climb and they could uh, climb any mountain? So I, I picked Michigan State to go all the way to the Final Four because I thought they had that kind of passion and were showing that upswing. And then finally, the third, last third was coaching. And by that, it was, was, the, was the coach someone who'd been there before? And in the case of Coach K from Duke, I thought he'd been there time and time again. And, and uh, that he might be able to make magic happen at the end. So uh, with all of that, 10% uh, 10, 10 was based on skill and 90% was based on luck. Uh, as my sons point out, even a blind pig can find uh, a mushroom. And so I, uh, in this case, uh, I was purely lucky. But 99.9% .9 on, on your bracket suggests I will never fill out a bracket again. That's it. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think we've had a glimpse uh, into your analytics, and, and that's very <laughs> impressive. And, and that actually leads me to my next question, which is, why and how have you pursued both private sector and public sector work, and what do they have to offer each other? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, there are a lot of people who go into the, into the public sector as a career, which I think is an excellent career with, uh, with great upside for learning and for impact uh, and uh, contribution to society. There are other people who decide to go into the private sector and make that their career. And likewise, I happen to believe that people who are working in the private sector are doing, are doing good things and, and uh, helping other people get good jobs and paying taxes. And that, those taxes allow us to do things like caring for the poor and the elderly. So a, uh, I think you do good whether you go into the public sector or private sector. There are some who uh, unexpectedly, as in my case, find themselves uh, starting in one path and then having the door open to the other. Now, for whatever reason, my dad followed that path. My dad was a uh, car executive. He, uh, he did not graduate from college, but he got a job working for the senator from Massachusetts, a Democrat senator from Massachusetts. He was his assistant on uh, trade and tariff policy. And, uh, and he went on to go to work in a, um, an association. This was the Automobile Association. And he worked there. And, became ultimately the head of this association. And, uh, and then uh, war broke out, Second World War, and my dad was asked as the head of the association to coordinate all of the wartime production of the automobile factories. Because someone had to put Ford and Packard and Chrysler and General Motors and, and uh, Nash Kelvinator, it was called at that point, had to coordinate all their production. And so he, he did that. And when the war was over, a couple of the companies were so impressed they asked him to join their company and that's what he did. So he was a car guy and at age 54 he was watching his state go down the drain. He thought that Michigan was being controlled by the UAW, that it was acting on its own, own behalf but not, and not on the behalf of the state, decided to run for governor, run and, uh, and won. So after that career of his he said to me, Mitt, don't get involved in politics unless, <laughs> <laughs> he had an unless, unless your kids are raised, and unless you're independent financially. Now, why was the logic of that uh, brought home to me? One was kids raised. He said, you know, he said, I'm concerned if you have to, if you have to win an election to pay your mortgage, uh, I'm concerned that that might shape your views about what you're going to think about a particular issue instead of thinking from your heart. And then number two, with regards to kids being raised, he said, I've seen too many families where the mom or the dad is elected to office and the kids are growing up and they think they're somehow special. 
because of what their mom or their dad is known for and the fame associated with the family's uh, position. And he said, so don't run for office unless those things happen, independent financially and kids raised. Now I knew someday my kids would be raised, even though I have five of them. Um, <laughs> but I never imagined I'd become independent financially. I, I went to work in a consulting firm and I was well paid, the, the firm did well, uh, but after our expenses and after the taxes and uh, a little bit of savings, there wasn't much left. And the idea that I'd become independent financially just didn't seem like that would ever uh, uh, be the case. Uh, and then, as you know, I, I left the consulting business and started a venture capital and private equity business. And the stock market went from like 1,000 to 10,000. It, it's hard to lose money uh, in the setting like that. And, uh, and I did far better than expected and became independent financially. And then after my Olympic experience, uh, I was asked by some to come back here and make a contribution as the governor of the, of the Commonwealth and decided that was something to try. And uh, I did. So you, you, can, you can move from one to the other. I would, by the way, keep your eyes open in doing that. The, 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 uh, it is not that hard to move from the private sector to the public sector. It's probably harder to go the other way. But in the private sector, the experience you have, the interactions you have with people, the leadership skills you develop, the understanding of the economy or the legal profession or any other aspect of the private sector that you gain, that skill, that knowledge, can be translatable into the, uh, into the governmental sector quite easily. And you can make a real contribution coming in with perspective and skills that many of the people there don't have because they haven't been in the private sector. So I, I would, I mean, I really would encourage you to, in the back of your mind, to say, you know, maybe someday the opportunity might arise where, where I would uh, be needed to work in a state, local, or, uh, or even a national type of uh, setting. And uh, we need smart people that have the right motivation who are there because they want to make a contribution, not there because they just want to make a buck. So I, uh, I encourage you to think about that. Governor, what took more physical and mental energy? Running Ben Capital, running Massachusetts, running the Olympics, running for president? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I kind of have one speed when I'm in high, high stress. Uh, in each position I've been in, I've been scared to death. I, w I was going to flunk, if you will. So when I came here, I came from Brigham Young University. I looked around. I don't know how many of you came from Harvard and Yale and Duke and, and all these Ivy League and top schools. And how I many thought, from Brigham Young here? Raise any, your any, hand. Any, oh, all right. That. One, two, three. All right. And so I was convinced I was going to flunk out. All right. So I worked like crazy. I spent most of my life down in the, I think it's the third floor below grade at the International Law Building <laughs> Library. I mean, I was down there studying, studying, and uh, much to my surprise, I did fine. You and did, uh, and then I came really out well. and, and, yeah, well. I came out and went to, and, and went to, uh, <laughs> I went to, uh, to my first job, and, and it's like, wow, I know nothing about business. I mean, I, I, how in the world can I be a consultant when I'm to companies and convince them to hire me to give them advice about their business when they've been in it all their careers and I know nothing about their business. This is crazy. I mean, I remember going to, to uh, the Tamaqua Knitting Mills in Tam Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, and uh, um, John Morgan was the CEO of, uh, of the Morgan Knitting Mills, and, uh, and I came into his office. His firm had hired me to come in and suggest how they could improve their operations in making long underwear, all right? And, uh, and he was at his desk, he's uh, uh, reading a Wall Street Journal, and I can't see his face. And then he puts the paper down, he looks at me, and he's, he's startled. And I'm here with the other consultant my age, and he stands up, and this guy is big. He's like 6'6". Six, six. He puts his hands in the air, and he says, boys, boys, they sent me boys, I need men. <laughs> So, as you can imagine, I worked hard to try and measure up and keep my job. And then, then when the, we started our venture capital firm, um, I, I, uh, I went around asking people for their money so I could invest it for them. Because at this stage, I didn't have anything of any significance in terms of savings. And, uh, uh, and so I, I would call on various professional organizations to give me their, you know, pension funds and so forth to give me money that I could invest for them. And uh, they said, have you ever done this before? No. <laughs> Is this your first fund? Yes. They said, well, come back after your first fund. And uh, 
I remember one, one fellow um, I went to, a very wealthy guy, said, how do you do with your own investments? And I tend to be uh, honest in settings like that. I said, well, actually, I've lost money with my own investments. Uh, <laughs> so he didn't give me any of his. Um, uh, after a year of hard work, we raised what we thought was a whopping amount, $37 million in our first fund. That was in 1984, 85. And, uh, and I remember calling my dad and saying, you know, I've got $37 million of other people's money. They've entrusted with me. And I've got to find a way to make money for them. And, and I've got to pay myself and our staff and our, and our space has to be paid for. And, you know, I'm, I'm worried. So I worked hard. <laughs> and then I went to the Olympics. And um, there was some irony in my going to the Olympics. I was not a great athlete. I did not letter in high school or college. Uh, I have five sons. We have a family competition every summer. I come in sixth every year. <laughs> and actually, when my, my oldest son saw the paper, uh, he said, Dad, I've talked to the brothers. We want you to know there's not a circumstance we could have conceived of that would put you on the front page of the sports section. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so, I, so in each setting, I, I, I have worked uh, at, at kind of 100%. How and about in yeah. contracts class with Professor Philip Arita? Uh, that was probably my favorite class here. Uh, I had prof uh, Professor Arita, and the, the faculty hall is named in his honor. Uh, a brilliant guy who pushed very hard. And uh, I learned a lot from, uh, from Professor Arita. Um, I did not have him for antitrust, even though he wrote the textbook on antitrust. Um, I had Justice Breyer for antitrust. I think back, I used to argue with him in class. Not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, this was a great experience. I loved it. OK, I can't resist. Did, have you drawn on anything you learned at the Harvard Law School in the rest <laughs> of your life? <laughs> Uh, yes, argument. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, I mean, Professor Arita, uh, Professor Jaffe, uh, uh, Professor Breyer, and others would, uh, would ask for you to uh, state a case or uh, to express your opinion on an item, and, uh, and then you would, and then inevitably they would say, why? And, uh, and push you to defend uh, uh, your position. I, I went to the, the joint program, business law program, the, the, uh, the, the we used to say a little saying we had was you could tell the difference between law students and business students. Business students had bags under their eyes because of all the reading, the massive reading they had to do. Law students had furrowed brows because of all the thinking they had to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so I figured that I, I gave a lot of thought to what, what was uh, being said. I remember Professor Arita one day was just zeroing in on me because I. I don't know what I'd done, but I, I gave an answer, and, and then he came back and pushed against me and said, yes, but Mr. Romney, how about this and this and this? And I responded, he says, yes, but, yes, but this, and then he kept on going and going, and this went on for quite a while. That meant you were doing well. I, I, exactly. I knew, <laughs> I knew I must be doing well if he keeps on you know, coming back to me and pushing me and pushing me. I must be giving good answers. And so when he was, when he was finished with me, he moved on to someone else, and I went back to start writing down some, some notes of the interchange, and then he came back and asked me, what did I think about what she had said? <laughs> oh, no. And I hadn't paid any attention. And, and he said, Mr. Romney, why weren't you paying attention? And I said, I was too busy writing down what I had just said. <laughs> and, uh, and he chuckled and moved on at that point. No, but the, the, uh, there's no question, but that the, the uh, thinking process, the delving deeper, the pushing deeper uh, in, uh, in your analysis, uh, that, that is uh, uh, pursued here at the law school is critical to a, a career in, um, in the private sector or in the public sector. I mean, uh, a big part of consulting, by the way, is going to a company that, uh, that's been doing something forever and they don't recognize that maybe some of the things they've been doing don't make sense anymore. So you begin pushing like Professor Arita did and asking questions and going deeper and deeper and deeper until they and you recognize, aha, maybe it's not like we thought it was. And bringing those kinds of insights were part of consulting and, by the way, part of investing. If, if uh, you're not going to be a successful investor in venture capital or private equity or any other kind of investing if you simply accept the conventional wisdom or you read the analyst reports that everybody else gets and on that basis, make your stock picks or your investment picks. The way you are successful in investing is figuring something out that other people don't see, and that is pushing deeper uh, and, uh, and analyzing more fully than the others do.
And that, of course, is uh, uh, one of the, the skills that's, that's taught here. I, I don't know that, that um, Harvard Law School is, the, uh, is the, the place to give you a, if you will, a textbook of law that you're going to then follow your, through your career. But it is instead an approach to, uh, to finding answers to difficult issues, uh, whether legal or, or business in nature, that, uh, that has helped me most in my career. Thank you for that. Your wonderful marriage and your wonderful sons are just such an example to so many. Can you explain how have you balanced work, family, uh, public life, community life? Um, let's see. I, I do remember at one point uh, feeling, um, well, I, th this is a regular point for me, feeling inadequate. And in this case it was, <laughs> I wasn't doing as much at school as my colleagues. Uh, I wasn't doing as much at home as I felt I needed to to be a good dad and, and a spouse. And I wasn't doing as much at my church as other people in my church were doing. And at that point I recognized if you feel that you're uh, underperforming in all three, you must have life in balance. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, if any one is doing swimmingly, you must be shortchanging the others. And so um, as time went on, I, I had a couple of rules. And everybody can pursue their own rules. One for me was when I came home, uh, I put away the, uh, the workbooks. Um, now, when I was going here, I studied um, at home. I studied, as a matter of fact, when I was here, I decided that I would not study on Sunday. It was about, I don't know, halfway through my second year because I just felt like there was a black cloud over me all the time that I should be studying all the time, <laughs> that everybody else was studying all the time. And I just said, I can't live like this. So I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Sunday and I'm not gonna study on Sunday. And it was marvelous. Because then on Sunday, I didn't feel guilty if I wasn't studying. It was just, that's just the deal. I don't study on Sunday. It gave me a day to sort of calm down, be with my, at this time I had two children while I was going to law school and, uh, and spend time with them. So that worked. As I, as I got into my career, um, I, uh, when I'd come home, I put the briefcase down and I didn't open it. When I was home, I was home. I was there for my kids and my family. Uh, now, if there was a big deal going on or if there was a, a major consulting assignment I had to work on, of course I made exceptions. But by and large, almost every night when I came home, and I didn't get home early, I didn't get home till 7.30 or 8, but I'd shut the briefcase and just not worry about it until I got back to work. This um, is such a, a challenge in an era of multitasking. Mm, yeah, yeah. When you're checking your smartwatch and your yeah, we didn't have we didn't we yeah uh, I still have a dumb watch and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know I remember well this is long ago I remember at business school four of us got together and bought a Bomar brain that was the first calculator the Bomar yes. brain one hundred and nineteen dollars I remember it well and it had four functions and and this this like put us miles ahead of anyone else in the class. It was fabulous. <laughs> and then at the it final could add, subtract, and <laughs> add, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And, uh, uh, and at the finals, they, the faculty got together and voted that we were not allowed to bring that into the finals. It was like, oh no. <laughs> we got to learn how to use the slide rule. And uh, uh, so it was a very different technology time. Um, and obviously, uh, but it, even then, I mean, I, I, throughout my life, I, I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure and do what I have to at my work, spend the time with my family in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, and then in terms of uh, my involvement in the community and my church, I said I'm going to give 10% of my time uh, to community service and church service. And, and that, you, you sort of make those rules and if you, if, you, uh, if you make them early enough and stand by them, they end up serving you pretty well. Your, your work uh, for the church, your work for nonprofits, uh, really are the community sector that we often don't hear about. And you know, I s so commend you, but I also want to ask, are there lessons for the nonprofit sector that to be offered from the business sector, um, from the public sector? Oh, no question about that. Um, the, uh, the nonprofit sector is extraordinarily inefficient and unproductive. And, uh, and, and overhead burden, uh, burdened, uh, as are many aspects of the healthcare industry is very much in that category. The education uh, uh, industry is, is very much overburdened. And, 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 uh, uh, and so there are many lessons to be taught from one, uh, one discipline uh, to another. 
in, in, uh, in the area of, of nonprofits. I was happy to be part of a nonprofit here known as, uh, uh, you probably know City Year, and, and sure. was involved with that. Started and, by and Harvard Law School alums. Exactly, yes. and, and th those guys were really, really good at finding a model that was uh, sustainable. Um, right now I'm working with um, a, a group of, of physicians at Brigham and Women's Hospital on uh, neurological research. This is something my wife has, has been championing. And uh, finding ways to do that in a, in a way that does not have centers all over America all doing exactly the same work, but instead uh, combining and collaborating across centers is, is something which I That's find very important. Great. So yeah, there, yes. uh, one of the fun things about being involved in the community at the same time you're involved in the private sector is that the, you can help provide some sharing of, of experience and, uh, and learning across those sectors. Some say that this is a time of massive distrust of established institutions, uh, whether it's government, law, um, banks. Uh, do you think that's true? If it's true, is it something that can be addressed? You know, I, I think it's, um, it, 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 it is something which we say uh, quickly and uh, 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 and, and in some respects pretend that we believe it, but then we have accounts at those banks and we borrow money mm -hmm. uh, to get our mortgage from those banks and institutions. Uh, we, we follow those inst institutions. We, we, uh, we may have distrust of the big uh, uh, internet institutions, but we all use Google and, and we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. And, and so we tend, uh, even though we say we distrust them, we tend, them use, we tend to use them um, as part of our, our daily lives. Uh, I think the most important thing is if we distrust is to understand why we distrust and then take action to try and, uh, and adjust those enterprises or to, to pass them by, to, uh, to ascend above them. Uh, one of the great things about, about this millennial age and, uh, and the technology we have is that individuals are able to connect with other individuals of like mind and to change the world around us. And we're seeing that in, uh, in really marvelous ways. Um, uh, both positive, by the way, and as well as some negative ways. And we, we look at, it, at the development of something like ISIS and say that that might not have been able to occur had there not been the kind of technology that ex exists today, but that's the reality. And, uh, and those of us who have very f firm beliefs in the power of freedom will have to use technology and the entrepreneurial spirit to be able to, to fight back and to, to preserve freedom for, uh, for our children and their children. We'll have to find something that's as distributed and decentralized and somehow can be mobilized to counter uh, hate and troubling uh, developments. I, now I can't resist but ask about polarization in this country. Um, it, it certainly is often also described that we are extremely polarized. Is that the case? And are there areas of overlap between the different political parties, different regions that are under-examined, under-exploited, where people could work together? I think, I think the polarization is real and probably um, uh, becoming worse. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons for that is that we don't uh, get the same information. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, there were three networks, three news programs, and we all watched one hour of evening news. Um, and all three had basically the same stories because they would look at each other's stories and, and uh, learn from one another. And so we got the same news. And then we could respond to it in different ways, but at least we got the same initial data. Uh, we also got our news from a certain number of newspapers. Uh, and whether you like the pap papers or not, we, we, we had the same foundation in terms of information. Today, uh, conservatives tend to get their news from one series of sources that they tend to agree with. And liberals tend to get their news from another series of sources they tend to agree with. And so we, we rarely have people with the same set of facts. And, and, and that makes us, I, I think, become more and more polarized because we look at others and say, how in the world could you possibly think what you do? Knowing what I know, how could you think what you do? But they don't know what you know and you don't know what they know because you haven't looked at the same facts. And so um, I, I am I'm hopeful that, that people of capacity will take the time not just to read and to watch what they agree with, but to understand what they disagree with. Um, uh, I, I think that critical to a society like ours is the kind of leadership associated with a, a president or governors or senators or education leaders uh, or even CEOs, despised as they may be. Uh, it's people in leadership who help try and bridge, bridge the gap. 
we have had times of a great uh, division in our country before, and at times of that nature, a, a great leader is able to step forward and bring people together. One of the uh, um, surprises of my career uh, and, and my experience over a lifetime in business and in government and in the not-for-profit sector is the impact of one person in a religion, in an institution of higher learning, in a charity, in a business, in a country. I mean, I mean you know, you go to Winston Churchill. Look at, I mean, look at the impact of one person and the character of that one person in terms of, of in some respects, saving the world. Um, and and uh, so while we are, the more polarized we become, the more I look for the kind of person who can step forward and bring people together. And, and there are people who say they will do that, but don't. And our country desperately needs leaders who will stand up and bring us together and find ways to, to bridge the gaps of understanding between people. And uh, I think we've, we've been missing that, and I think we need it. When I think about how campaigns have changed from the time that your father was in the business to your experience, some of it, the media that you're describing, some of it uh, just nastiness, frankly, um, I, I wonder what, what you would say to people who are inclined to do public service but say, I don't want to go through any of that. Yeah, you've got to have a bit of a tough skin. And, and you know, you look back, I don't know that it's gotten worse. I mean, I go back mm -hmm. and I read some of the tracks that were that were uh, set around the country in the very earliest days with Adams and Jefferson well, and so forth. And I'll tell you, there were some pretty brutal things. That's true. And you know, family wasn't off limit. You know, uh, personal attacks were not off limit. I mean, these Looks. things. That's true. I mean, it, it was it was tough back then. It's tough now. And when you get into the um, uh, the public sector, particularly if you're going to run for political office, you have to know that's part of the the story. I mean, it's blood sport. And, and, you know, it's, uh, politics is sport for old guys. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and so that goes with the territory. And, and politicians who spend their time complaining about the media are really missing it. You have to know that's part of the playing field. I mean, you know, if, if you go out, if you're playing football and you complain about there being natural grass, it's like, hey, the field is grass. Get used to it, fella. All right? And so if you get into politics, um, you know, the field is going to be, you're going to have, a, a, you, you know, which are the sources of media that are on your side and which ones aren't. And, and if you own a newspaper or a television station, you're allowed to say what you want to say. Uh, and so if they, they don't like you and they beat you up, that's the way it's, that's fair. That's how the, the system works. So your job is to figure out how to use that and, uh, and how to take advantage of it. I remember when I, when I ran for governor, my, my, uh, my advisor, a guy named Mike Murphy, he said, I got a number of rules uh, before I'll sign up with you. One is this, you can't read any newspaper stories about you or your campaign. <laughs> I said, you're kidding. He said, no, no, no. He said, you can watch TV. You can see what, what's happening on TV because we'll, we'll run the airwaves. We will run our campaign so the TV news gets our message out. But we can't count on the Boston Globe or the Boston Herald, and so you can't read those stories. And I said, well, why? I got thick skin. I can read it. He said, because inevitably, subconsciously, you're going to find yourself responding to what you read in the paper that morning. That morning. Some 25-year-old writer is going to write some snotty thing and you're going to be defending against it all day long in all your speeches. And, and I want you to be on your message, not on his or her message. And uh, it turned out to be good advice. It's we didn't advice. read all the articles written about me during the presidential campaign. It's a good thing, apparently. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, you, uh, so if, if you get involved in, in political life, yeah, they're going to look at your income tax and how you made your money. They're going to look at what you looked at on the internet. They're going to look at your things you wrote. You can look at what you wrote here in school. Um, and uh, uh, that's just part of the story. And, and most of that won't make a heel of a beans worth, worth a difference uh, in the final analysis as to what people will do. And you just get used to it and plow on. We've talked about polarization in the country. What about within the Republican Party? What will it take to build a common message, common mission? Well, um, you know, we do have very different voices in our party. That's in part a function of not having the White House. When you have the White House, the president, of course, speaks for his party and disciplines anybody in his party who's a real pain in the rear. And, and, and 
if somebody is saying crazy stuff that he or she really disagrees with, they can punish them by saying, hey, I'm going to come into your district and get someone to run against you. I'm going to put money behind them, raise money for them, and get you out of office. That tends to concentrate the mind. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and so presidents are able to corral, to a certain degree, members of their own party. And, uh, and, and so there's more discipline in terms of message that comes by having particularly a new president um, and having the White House. When you don't have the White House, you have several hundred members of Congress and governors and state houses who think their message should be the message of the party. And so they're out expressing their views and they're going to be different. And we have uh, now uh, not had the White House for a number of years and so we have all those messages being, being sent and at some point the people of my party will decide whose message is the one that represents their thinking and we will select that person as our nominee for 2016 and that will become the message of my party. Uh, if we win, that will be the message for four to eight years. If we lose, we'll continue to have these different voices saying, well, the reason we lost is because your message is wrong and my message is right. And so we'll have that, that battle going on. What we have now, um, we have Rand Paul who represents a real libertarian strain in the Republican Party. And I think he's bringing some very interesting perspectives and uh, viewpoints to the Republican Party. And I think helping attract new voters to our party. Um, people say, gosh, I agree with that guy. I'm not a Republican, but I agree with that Republican Rand Paul. I like that. Uh, and even though he and I don't agree on every issue, I like what he's talking about and the impact he's having. Uh, Ted Cruz takes a very different approach to governance. Uh, <laughs> oh, you've heard of him, have you? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Another Harvard Law School grad. Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Ted's, Ted's tactical approach is very different than that of other members of my party. And, uh, and, then, the, and then you have, uh, you know, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Scott Walker, Lindsey Graham. Um, Bobby Jindal. Uh, Bobby Jindal. Uh, uh, yeah. More graduates in here? If I, no. I don't know. No, okay. um, <laughs> Carly Fiorina, others who are, are a little more towards the center of my party, at least as I calculate it, uh, and, and we'll hear what their views are on everything from taxation to social policies and policies to alleviate, alleviate poverty, foreign policy. So we're going to have those different uh, messages and there'll be battles within our party. And, and if Hillary Clinton were to have a, a, a strong challenger from the left and the right of her party, she'd have the same thing. I don't think that's likely to happen. I don't know, Lincoln Chafee, I guess, did you see, is, is mm -hmm. uh, thinking of running, uh, former governor of uh, Rhode Island, uh, once a Republican, now a Democrat, and uh, he will run to her left. That's, a, that's quite a movement from the Republicans. <laughs> uh, uh, but he's been there, he's been there quite a while. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, think, I think it's healthy to have that kind of debate. In some respects, it recalibrates a party. And, uh, and I think once we have a nominee, why our, our our footing and grounding will be more secure. I, by the way, I didn't mention all, I didn't mention Chris Christie. I mean, there are a lot of really good people in my party that, that will express their views and, uh, and will we'll come to settle, I think. So in a minute, I'm gonna invite you to ask questions, but first I have one more, which, what, you have these wonderful sons. I wonder what advice you give them. What do you think are the greatest challenges and opportunities for the generation that's represented by your sons and by these students? Um, you know, I have not tried to guide my sons in their own careers, and they have chosen very different paths. Um, uh, your generation is more entrepreneurial than mine. Um, mine tended to think about going to work in a corporation and uh, working your way up. When I was at, at business school, actually after my first year here at Harvard Law School, I, I went to Chrysler Corporation on an internship, thinking I wanted to become an automobile executive like my dad had been. And, uh, and so I was there one summer and I hated it. It was uh, so bureaucratic uh, and uh, so layers, layer upon layer of bureaucracy. I mean, at five o'clock, there was a jam at the parking lot, everybody going home exactly at five. It's like, I, so I, I didn't appreciate that and, and, and looked for a different path. And it, my path became more entrepreneurial than I had expected, uh, getting into private equity and venture capital. Um, and, and so my sons have tended to be more entrepreneurial than, than I was uh, at the, in their first mm -hmm. steps. I have uh, three sons who are in real estate, but not together. 
um, uh, meaning they work in, in different enterprises, uh, each their own enterprises, uh, but they're buying multifamily uh, buildings and so forth. They have investors that they, whose money they invest buying apartment buildings and so forth. Three are doing that. One is a doctor uh, uh, and uh, a radiologist, and, and the last works in private equity and venture capital. Uh, again, his own firm. So none are working in a major corporation. Um, uh, four in business, one in, in medicine. The guy in medicine, I used to joke that he's the first Romney smart enough to go to medical school. And uh, uh, he loves, the, uh, uh, loves research, and that's a good part of what he does. So I, Thank you. you know, for them, I mean, I, I happen to believe that, that uh, uh, you really want to get as much out of living as you possibly can. You will not be here forever. You want to live life uh, in full. You want to have the ex every experience in life you possibly can. You're only here for a short period of time. Uh, I encourage my, my kids, I said, look, if you find someone you fall in love with and you want to be with that person, marry them, have kids. It's a huge part of life experience. And so my boys have married and now I have 23 grandkids. All right? uh, and uh, I encourage them also to be involved in their communities, po politics, as well as their religious community and other uh, social uh, uh, dimensions of their community. And uh, uh, I, you know, I wish them well. I, I can't imagine what the world is going to be like over the next hundred years. I just wish I could stay and watch. It's <laughs> fantastic. So questions, I'm going to ask you to identify yourself and make your questions brief. Who has one? There's one over here. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Jurgen. I'm actually an interlooper from across the river. I'm in Section I, which you were in Section I, right? Exactly, yeah. Yes, I, and I'm joining the Kennedy School, and I also had the pleasure of being able to work while I was in school a bit on your presidential campaign. Thank you. Um, my question is, you were, the, you were the governor here in Massachusetts. Now, again, I would say, thankfully, we have a Republican governor, but Republicans have struggled a bit in the Northeast recently when, when it was, at one point, actually, in fact, the base of the party what are your thoughts going forward on how Republicans can be competitive in the Northeast again? Um, I, I think we have a real problem in my party, and I am uh, part of that problem in, in terms of communicating what we stand for and why what we stand for is designed and is most effective in helping people of moder modest incomes, the poor and the middle class. Uh, our opposition party has done a great job characterizing us as the party of the rich. The rich will do fine whether Republicans or Democrats are presidents or governors. The rich do fine anywhere in the world. The rich take care of themselves very well, find a way to take care of themselves. The question is, who's going to do the best job for the middle class and the poor? And the reason I ran for office, the reason I ran as governor, the reason I ran for president is because I believed my policies and my leadership will be more, most likely to help people come out of poverty and most likely to help the middle class see better incomes and better outcomes. That, that, and I'm absolutely convinced of that. I'm convinced that conservative principles create more enterprises and more good jobs, which causes competition to hire people, which causes wages to go up. And, that, and that's why I'm a Republican. And we have difficulty as a party breaking through and getting that message out. The opposition party says, oh, but you're rich. You're therefore a bad guy. You're rich. And it becomes, well, I, you know, I, I'm trying to help other people. Yeah, but you're rich. And, and so we spend our time talking about, <laughs> you know, talking about, well, you know, how much did you pay in taxes? What was your tax rate? Well, it was as low as I possibly could make it. All right? <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, anybody who pays more taxes than they're legally required to pay, probably should be disqualified. <laughs> so, so now, if you, now you, maybe you want to change the tax code, and, and that's fine too. We can have that discussion as to how to get uh, a more fair share, as we would describe it, to think about it. But the, the key is this. You, you, you spend your time talking about all the periphery, but what I, what I failed at being able to do was to communicate nationally that I was here to really help the people of the middle class and the poor, and that's why I was running, and my policies would do that. And I mean, I believe that with regards to education. I believe Republicans improve education, and Democrats don't. You think, well, that can't be. I think the problem is the, t the teachers' union, and it's, it's extraordinary financial grip on the Democratic Party. In terms of poverty, I believe our policies get people out of poverty, and the Democratic policies keep them in poverty. 
We've had a war on poverty since 1964 under Lyndon Baines Johnson. His heart was in the right place, but the policies weren't. We now have more poor people in America than ever in history. One out of five. What? Generational poverty. Uh, I, I believe our policies are better designed to help incomes go up and have more jobs. So that's why I'm a Republican. And our problem in the Northeast and our problem nationally is our candidates have not been as effective communicating that as we should have been. And I was not as effective as I wish I would have been. I got elected here because I communicated it well in my race for governor, but didn't do as well on my race for the White House. Thank next, you. Next question. There's one down here. Hi, Governor Hi. Romney. Um, I know when Say who you, you are, are please. Oh, my name is Cheryl Dickey, and I work here at the law school. Um, I know when you were governor, uh, you actively blocked the same-sex marriage decision here by the SJC. And now, here we are 10 years later, over 25,000 couples have gotten married in Massachusetts and gone on to raise children and are productive members of our community. I'm sure you, you know uh, s several gay couples in your life. Um, now that we're on the verge of perhaps the Supreme Court legalizing same-sex marriage, I wonder if you have any regrets or reflections or, or um, changes of thinking uh, since that first decision here in Massachusetts. Well, my opposition made a great deal of, of uh, saying that I flip-flopped, and I'm happy to announce that I have the same position now that I had at the uh, uh, 10 years ago, and that is I believe marriage is a relationship between a man and a woman. That the ideal setting for raising a child is where there's a man and a woman in marriage. That's my view. But you know what? Well, the, the Supreme Court may make a decision which is different than that, and we abide by the law of the land. Um, uh, that we, we're entitled to have different perspectives. I just happen to think that's the perspective that's, uh, uh, that's both historic and appropriate. But I certainly respect people who have different viewpoints and obviously um, uh, believe that discrimination against people based upon their sexual orientation is wrong and should be uh, prohibited. And, and I've seen uh, some states, by the way, recently uh, passed legislation uh, uh, providing uh, uh, anti-discrimination provisions. I think that makes sense. Next question, right here. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Michael Dwyer. I'm a student uh, graduating next year. Last week, the ACLU sponsored some events here at Harvard Law, and they shed light on some of the shortcomings of the war on drugs. I was just curious if you had any thoughts about uh, the war on drugs and any ideas of addressing that in the future. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, obviously it's been an extraordinarily unsuccessful battle to date. Um, and, and we look to see are there places where the battle is being waged more successfully and look at, see if there's some positive examples. We're, we're seeing some tests of that in our own country as well as other countries. In my own view, we should devote more of our resources to helping um, from a marketing standpoint to convince people not to use drugs in the same way we did with tobacco. And, and, uh, uh, and I think that's a more effective way to try and uh, pull back the extraordinary expansion of the drug culture um, and, the, um, uh, and the peril of drugs in our society. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I would uh, uh, legalize all drugs in the country. I don't think that's the right course to take. But I do think that using our resources to help um, uh, convince young people not to get started in drugs, not to use drugs, and to use the marketing approach will be a more effective way for us to, to put a dent in, uh, uh, in, in this uh, apparel. Um, but time will tell, and we'll learn from the experiences of one another. Next question, right here, in the front row. Hi, Governor Romney. Thank Hi. you for being with us today. My name is Damie Sanchez, and I'm a 3L from Miami, Florida. And my question is, what was, your, what was the biggest challenge that you encountered running for president, and what advice do you give the candidates that are running in 2016? Um, I'm having some fun in talking to the people who are running in 2016. <laughs> uh, a number of them have been kind enough to either come by and see me or give me a call and ask me that question. Uh, and, the, uh, uh, and I talked to them about, about uh, policies. Uh, one of the things I have mentioned to them, and I don't know that it's falling on, mm. on open ears, um, uh, but, uh, but I say be very careful in the policies you adopt so they cannot be demagogued 
uh, into saying we're the party of the rich. All right, we, we, we know that's what they're going to hit us with, whoever our nominee is. Uh, we know that they'll say our policies are to make the rich richer. And so I say be very careful not to adopt tax policies that will be able to be demagogued as being about helping the rich. So that's as, as one small example. Number two, I tell them that, that, uh, that we have a special need to reach out to minority voters and to do so early. Now, that's something which is kind of hard for someone who's running, let's say there are 15 people running in our primary. One of them is going to get the nod to become our nominee. And that person knows that, by and large, minority voters don't vote in Republican primaries. And so for the next almost two years, they will be inclined to spend all their time, not with minority voters, because they're not going to be selecting them as the nominee, but instead with the majority voters, the white population. That's where they'll go. That's who they'll be speaking to. When we finally get a nominee in, let's say, June, they will now run to minority voters asking for their vote, and the minority voters will appropriately say, where have you been? And the answer is, oh, well, I've been out you know, trying to become the nominee among the people who typically select our nominees. And that's a mistake, a mistake I made as well, which is we need to, to work with minority communities well before we become the nominee and encourage them to watch our campaigns, to know of our concern, to hear how it is our policies will be most designed to help them and their families. Likewise, during the, once you become the nominee, we've got to watch the Hispanic media and see what's being said in Hispanic media and respond to those things that aren't right and make sure we have an equal voice in minority media so that, again, our message is getting through. Hardest, hardest thing for me, I mean, it's physically draining. I mean, I, I probably spent 330 nights in a hotel room, uh, almost never the same hotel room uh, twice. Um, I, I made it a practice. Our staff had to get my wife and me together at least one day out of every seven. We got together. Uh, we took most of the Sundays off. Um, so there are a few things that, that help on the, on the physical side. Uh, the hardest part about the campaign was losing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's much more fun to win than to lose. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, that being said, it's an exhilarating experience. R running for president brings you into homes of people across the country. These are not the people who made the nightly news. These are not the people who did bad stuff to make the nightly news. These are average American citizens who are raising families, uh, building businesses, starting internet companies, um, are going to work in a factory, and they're good people. Patriotic, hardworking, um, caring about things bigger than themselves. And so I came away exhilarated from the campaign, more optimistic about America more confident in our future. The heart of the country is good. And uh, if you get the chance to run for president, do it. It's great. It's really <laughs> uh, so I, I have to tell you, it, you know, there were challenging things, but it was a wonderful experience. The biggest surprise, by the way, for me was I, I, got, I shook so many hands, and I didn't realize that as you shake all these hands, that it can make your, your back get a little sore, a muscle in your back. So I get this. So one night I was in San Francisco, and this muscle in my back was killing me. And, and it was kind of early in the campaign. And I asked the guy who travels with me, Garrett Jackson, I said, can you get someone to massage my back? And he found a, 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 a massage a, a center and they sent a, 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 a lovely Hispanic woman over to give me a back massage. She came to my room, he was there with us. And she gave me the massage and, and after it was almost over, she turned to him and she said, Mr. Romney, is he a dancer? And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, these legs have never been considered dancing legs before. <laughs> was the highlight of my campaign. <laughs> Is there a question in this over here? In the back there, yes. Hi, Governor Romney. My, excuse me. My name is Charles Geyer. I'm a 2L originally from New Orleans. And uh, as you know, not every Olympics is an absolute disaster, but cities like Barcelona and Athens and even Atlanta arguably serve as reminders that a city puts it itself at a huge risk of taking a huge financial hit. Um, shouldn't Boston be begging to not get the Olympics because it, it, it doesn't seem like there's an enormous upside and there's a huge risk? Yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I don't look at the Olympic decision as a financial decision. I know there are many who do. They say how much money will come in from the visitors? Uh, how much federal money will we get for highways and uh, infrastructure? 
how many buildings will we build, for instance, for either for the media or for the athletes that will stay behind? Uh, and uh, will there be an endowment left? In our case in Salt Lake City, we left $100 million in profit behind as an endowment to maintain facilities. So there are some that look at the dollars and cents of Olympics, and I, I think on that basis it's a, uh, an uncertain call for most cities. Um, I think an American city would spend a lot more time, as we did, looking at the dollars and cents of the things they're going to build, what the cost will be, what their sources of revenue are to make sure they will be balanced, uh, and not require a government uh, bailout. Um, but the city, the host city, is on the hook. The, the host city, uh, and potentially the state or the federal government, depending on the country, uh, is responsible to make sure the games go on. Um, and, uh, and so there is a financial uh, a risk associated with that. So for me, if I, if I don't look at it as a dollar and cents proposition, why do I consider it at all? And why do I like the Olympics um, for a host city? And the answer is because it brings the city together. It is, the Olympics is about an opportunity to serve the world. It is about saying, we're going to welcome you to our community, and we're going to have tens of thousands of us give you 30 days of volunteer service. We're going to come together and, and eat together, sleep together, work our uh, hearts uh, uh, together, and, uh, and we're going to welcome the athletes of the world, first the Olympians, then the Paralympians, 17 days each, and we're going to welcome the world here and show them America, show them our city, show them our culture, show them our passion, and it's about service. So for me, the Olympics is a service opportunity. If a city sees it as a service opportunity and, and, uh, and gets behind it in that way, I think they'll, they'll find it extraordinarily rewarding. I know in, in Salt Lake City, for instance, I think that the poll after the Olympics, like 80% said, let's do it again. Uh, Sydney, I think the same, same thing. If they see it instead of a, as a money, and, a money thing, I, I, I mean, who gets excited about a money thing? Um, uh, a few people, perhaps. But it's, it's really about, it's really about uh, showcasing the great qualities of the human spirit through these young athletes for the whole world to see. The, the Olympic audience is several billion people a night. Billion. And they see your country. They see your volunteers. They see the athletes. They see courage, determination, um, uh, uh, teamwork, faith, patriotism. Uh, passion. They see all these things. I like my kids and the kids of the world to see those things. I mean, I, I've sat in these Olympic events, as you can imagine, when I got the job. I, I, I go to these events with people from other countries. What astonished me is we would cheer for one another. It's not just Americans cheering for Americans, although we did that too. But if you saw a great performance, you cheer the great performance. It's, it, the Olympics brings people together. So for me, if Boston wants to welcome the world and serve the world, and say, you know what, uh, we're going to do what it takes to welcome people here and to let them see our city and the history of America as it's expressed in this city and our values, uh, and we're going to make that contribution to the world, then it'll be successful. If Boston says, hey, no, what's in it for me, then uh, it won't work. Question over here. Hi, Governor Romney. I'm Hi. Rebecca Littman. I'm a 3L. Um, I saw the really excellent documentary, Mitt, that was on Netflix, and I think like a lot of people thought it was a really warm, engaging portrait of you um, that maybe wasn't always reflected in the same way in the news media of the campaign trail. And actually a lot of people are commenting this uh, with Hillary Clinton right now. They say she's incredibly engaging and likable in person, but once she's on the campaign trail, the same impression isn't drawn. I just wondered what you thought was sort of the biggest challenge or why it was so incredibly challenging to get across an authentic picture of a candidate. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the real challenges we have in, in our country, and I'm sure it's been the case from the beginning of, of our country, and that is how do you communicate who you really are, particularly when the opposition team has as its objective, uh, in some respects, uh, uh, defining you in a less than flattering way. And uh, there's an advantage to being a known commodity. I think in the case of Secretary Clinton, we know her pretty well. We, she's been around a long enough time that, that it would be difficult for Republicans to try and define her in a way that's totally at odds with who she is. Um, it's easier if someone, let's say Chris Christie becomes the nominee, or Jeb Bush. We don't know Jeb Bush terribly well, or Scott Walker. 
we don't know him well, and so it will be easier for the opposition party to define him in ways that may be less than flattering. What are your, what are your um, options as a candidate to define yourself and, and, to, and to do so in a way that's more flattering and more authentic than the opposition is going to do? You don't have a lot of opportunities. Um, you have 30-second ads, and you know, you by and large want to talk about policy and, and uh, hit back at your opponent in those few 30-second ads you get. You have the debates, and they're pretty artificial. You're standing behind a podium wearing a suit and, and being asked questions, and, and um, those are probably your really only opportunities. Um, you know, the media will do a profile piece here and there, but uh, you know, people have looked at this documentary that was done. Those that haven't seen it, uh, Netflix uh, ran a documentary called Mitt. Uh, we had a documentary filmmaker who followed us in both in 2008 and 2012. And I mean, followed us everywhere. Um, and, and, and then put a film together. I told him, by the way, people said, did you edit this? And the answer is no. I told him if I won, I was going to edit it, all right? Because uh, this, this would be a story of the President of the United States, and it couldn't just be anything. But if I lost, Hey, you know, do your do your best, and uh, <laughs> so I lost. So he put it together, and uh, uh, and uh, and it's running. People have said, "Why didn't you show that during the campaign? It would have shown a different, very different side of you." Well, the truth is, had we shown it during the campaign, I would have wanted, and my staff would have wanted to edit it to make sure, you know, I, I wasn't saying something that would be contradictory or inflammatory or whatever, and and people would assume, of course, that it was a a puff piece, and. And no one would want to watch it. I mean, you'd have almost no audience. I mean, who's going to sit down and watch a one and a half hour puff piece about a candidate? Um, so it, I, I don't know that we've got a great way of doing that. I, I look back and say, I wish I'd have done more uh, Tonight Show and David Letterman and um, uh, SNL and, and um, some of those things. This is a chance for people to see me in a, in a, in a different context. We did some of that. I, you know, I was with Dave. Uh, Letterman and, 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 and on The Tonight Show as well uh, a couple of times, but I guess doing more of that is probably the right way to go. I think Bill Clinton did that well, um, you know, got out there with a saxophone and, and uh, uh, I think that probably helps, but, but uh, you know, I, I did that here. I, I had a, uh, uh, when I was running for governor here um, and was not well defined, I decided one of the things I was going to do is that every week spend one day doing someone else's job. And so I was a garbage man one day. I made uh, Franks at, at, at Fenway Park one day. Uh, I worked in a nursing home one day. I worked uh, in a daycare center a day. I worked in a, on a paving crew one day. And by the way, it was really, was really educational. I found, for instance, I, on, the back, you know, on the garbage truck, there's, there's the, uh, the guy that stands on the back of the garbage truck, all right, just hangs on there. I stood on there and was dro drove the garbage truck through the city of Boston. And, and I, we'd pull up to a corner. There'd be people waiting across the street. And I am not more than two feet from these people. And they don't see you. You are invisible. You're in a gar garbage truck. You're an invisible person. It was amazing to me that, uh, that we see people who are like us and dressed like us and doing the same things. And I, and I thought, wow, we, we don't see each other as we ought to in, in society. Um, the hardest job, by the way, well, I have to tell you one, on that garbage truck, I, you know, the, the levers in the back that, that caused the, uh, this big thing to come down and crush the garbage. And so I filled up the whole back bin, and then I pulled the lever, and it went the wrong way. It went out oh, no. and pushed all, all the garbage onto the, onto the street. And, uh, and there were these, there were these uh, let me tell you, no one came to my aid, all right? People just, <laughs> you know, walk around the garbage man. And, and, uh, uh, but there were some guys working in a, in a building, uh, con you know, contractors swinging the hammer. They came down. They all came down laughing. They came down, picked up all the stuff with me. Uh, it's interesting how, uh, how we can connect with one another. But the hardest job by far was the lowest paid, working in the daycare center. And I have to admit, I did not stay the whole day. It's like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> I can't handle this. It is, it is hard work. <laughs> We have, I have one last question for you, which is, when are you coming back? <laughs> Please join me in thanking Governor Wong. Thank Martin. you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. You did a very kind. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks. Roger?